Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week we are talking the rules of epoxy table making. And I want to give a quick distinction. This is not the tips and tricks for epoxy table making. I have probably, son of a bitch, tips and tricks are great, but they are just going to make your table incrementally better a little bit at a time. These rules are the things that can cause catastrophic failure that you really can't come back from, or you are really, really going to compromise the finished product that you're putting out. The first rule, keep it as thick as possible, as long as possible. And let me elaborate a little bit on that because that probably doesn't make sense. What I mean by that is if you have say three inch thick slabs and you only want a two inch finished table, what I used to do is I would say, well, I'll just plane those down to two and an eighth inch because I want to save epoxy. I don't want to pour three inches worth of epoxy. The problem with that is there are so many things that can go wrong in the process of making these tables that you almost always need the extra thickness, meaning they, they can twist, they can warp slightly as you are doing your epoxy pour and as it's curing, that by the time you plant it down in the end, you will really wish you had saved that extra thickness. So keep it as thick as possible, as long as possible. It does cost a little bit more money if you say have two and a half inch thick slabs, but I say pour the full two and a half inches because you will be shocked at how many times you need that extra thickness. All right, this next rule is kind of a hot topic debated issue in the epoxy table community. And one of the main reasons is Black Forest Wood Co. actually feels the exact opposite way that I feel about this rule. And first off, I'm friends with those guys. I talk to Dylan regularly. There is no hard feelings either way. I'll talk about why they feel one way and I'll talk about why I actually go the other way with it. But that rule is sealing your edges. First off, I'll talk about Black Forest position. They feel that if you pour the epoxy on bare wood, you have that epoxy penetration gets a better bond and will never separate from the wood. And I actually agree with this. I think that epoxy touching bare wood gives you the best possible bond. The problem with that is I use so many liquid dyes and particularly really, really concentrated black dye, that, that black dye will, see, will soak in and stain the wood. And so I have actually lost tables and had really, really bad problems with these stained wood tables. And so what I do is I seal my edges. And I used to seal it with a faster drying epoxy where I would paint on a clear kind of marine epoxy, wait till it was hard, scuff it up, and then pour my tables. And I've never had a table edge separate. That is how I used to do it though. I actually have a slightly better way now. And what I do now is I paint the edges with that same liquid glass deep pour epoxy. And then I wait about 12 hours or so and I let that epoxy start to cure, meaning that it's still tacky, but the epoxy won't be able to penetrate it. And so what you get in that instance is you get a really, really good chemical bond. Whereas if you just scuff the edges, you get that mechanical bond. And I do feel that if you get that chemical bond, you get kind of the best of both worlds where you get that bonding to the wood fibers like the Black Forest method where they don't seal it and you still get that stain protection that you get with sealing the edges. So bit of a hot topic debated issue but I always, always seal my edges, at least with using liquid dye, because those are the ones that are going to soak in and stain the wood. If you're using powdered pigments, which Black Forest uses primarily, you can get away with not sealing your edges and not having any issues with staining. Another kind of fringe benefit to this is that you get less bubbles on the edge of your wood because those bubbles come from air releasing from the wood. And if you seal it in advance, you kind of seal in all of that air. The next rule, clamp your pieces down. I don't know why I have to make this a rule, but I keep making this mistake. I'll set like a five gallon bucket on it and think that's gonna be fine. Or one time I set 75 pounds of actual like gym weights on the wood, went inside and I came back and the whole thing was floating up in the epoxy. And so that would be absolutely catastrophic if you say had you know a twisted slab floating sideways in your epoxy and there'd basically be no way to recover from that. And so just clamp them down. It's so quick, it's so easy, and you can really avoid some real problems with that. One technique that I do when I'm clamping it down is I'll clamp them snug or tight, but just not overly tight, meaning that wood, I like to let it move with that epoxy because the epoxy shrinks slightly. I've never had a problem clamping it too tight. However, just in theory, I feel like if I clamped it too tight, you could kind of run into a problem as that epoxy shrinks when it cures, not allowing the wood to move with it. So just something to think about, or you could just release the clamps as that epoxy started to set up, you know, maybe 24 hours later. Next rule, remove all the bark. And I don't even think this one's debated. I know some people 
pour with the bark attached, but nobody that actually knows what they're doing would pour with the bark attached. It's a horrible idea. I've had people comment saying that they did it and it's fine. I do not believe it will remain fine. I think that is a horrible, horrible idea because bark will fall off just sitting there without any any type of stress or wood movement. And so that epoxy is never gonna really be able to completely penetrate that epoxy all the way to the bare wood. So I am very, very meticulous about not just removing the bark, but all of the little fibers. I get the wire wheels out. I want just good, clean, bare wood so I can really get that epoxy bond right onto the wood because any little loose piece of debris or dirt is gonna wiggle off over time. And so I always make sure to remove all of the bark. And I think that might've actually been the problem with the black forest table where they sealed the edges. I think they actually did it with a table with bark. Don't quote me on that. If Dylan, if you happen to watch this, maybe leave a comment and I can pin that for everybody. But I think that was an issue. And I have talked to the Black Forest guys. They do not recommend leaving the bark on. I think they tried it on some early tables and had some issues. So always remove all the bark and all the loose fibers that remain kind of touching this live edge there. This next rule is a rule that I continue to let myself down on, meaning I don't listen to myself and I just think it's fine and end up regretting it in the end. And that is to always use fans on your epoxy pours. And I don't know why I don't listen to myself. This is another one of those rules that I talk about in my workshop. And when I don't follow it, my wife's like, but that's one of your rules. Why didn't you follow your rule? And I, and I never have a good answer. So always use fans. And I just use, you know, one or two box fans is usually fine per epoxy pour. You know, you can run it. So the air is just going right down the length of the river portion. And the reason for this is that the epoxy, as it cures, it heats up. And so you can pour, you know, pretty thick. The Black Forest guys, they will pour, you know, up to like four inches thick. I don't recommend pouring that deep myself. They actually have like a water-cooled table that enables them to pour so thick. I just try to elevate my piece a little bit and then get a fan on it. And so many times it's kind of a cool day. I pour, you know, an inch and three quarters and I think I'm fine. And then I come out and the temperature is really spiking. And, you know, I haven't had one crack in a long, long, long time. And part of that is the epoxy that I'm using now is really reliable, but I still am worried about that. And so always get a fan on there and just kind of get the fan on. So it is rippling the surface just a little bit. And I understand the reason you might not want to do this because you think that you're going to blow dust and debris into it, but think about it this way is the surface tension of the epoxy is a lot more than the surface tension of water. And if, uh, you know, a loose hair or something lands on it, it's going to be sitting right on top and you're going to end up surfacing the top anyway. So you really aren't going to get like big chunks unless you actually drop something heavy into your epoxy. It's going to stay right on top. You're going to surface it anyway. You're going to run a planer or, you know, a router sled over the top. So almost any dust and debris that is circulated in the air, it's going to land right on top. It's going to stay there. You can surface it in the, you know, that first sixteenth of an inch and you'll be just fine. After the epoxy temperature peaks in, you know, anywhere from 18 to 24 hours and it starts to come back down, you can actually turn the fans off at this point and that will also allow the epoxy to kind of self-level. You won't get actual like waves in your epoxy. Even if you do, again, you're going to surface them off. It's not that big of a deal. But if you want to let it self-level a little bit, turn the fans off after the epoxy temperature peaks and is coming back down and you'll be just fine. All right, next up is always seal your forms and don't just seal them, but allow them to dry overnight, meaning at least 12 to 24 hours before you pour any epoxy in your forms. And I learned this lesson probably the hardest way possible. I was hosting my very first epoxy table workshop up at Gobi Walnut and I wanted to show the class how to make the forms and the caulk said it cured in 20 minutes, so I thought I'd be fine. So made my epoxy form in class, waited a couple hours, poured the epoxy, and it started leaking out in front of everybody. And at the time, I didn't know how to stop an active leak. Luckily, I do now. But then I was terrified. I tried to tell them that I did this so they could learn from my mistakes, and they laughed and knew that I was kidding. But it was really, really embarrassing, and eventually I was able to stop the leak. But that was one of the hard lessons I learned, is you need to let that caulk dry overnight, just be completely cured. And I've done this multiple times in my own house, you know, you'll wait six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, and you think that it's fine. 
and it's not fine. Don't do it that way. If you wanna bypass the entire form making process and not have any concerns, you can go to my buddies up at Concept 13 and they have these pre-made forms. They're basically a plastic tub and they're really, really clever because you don't even need mold release with them because they are made from this HDPE, I think, basically really slick plastic. And the edges are even contoured, contoured, beveled, whatever you wanna say. So they form kind of a reverse wedge so your table will pop out really easily. And I think it's a really clever design. They are an investment. I don't really recommend them if you're just gonna build one table. But if you have any designs on making multiple tables, especially the same size, you can order one of these forms custom made to your size, ship it out to you, and then you're basically foolproof way of never having a leak in epoxy table. If you aren't gonna use one of those pre-made forms, the next rule is to always use mold release. If you are gonna be using, you know, melamine like I use or plywood with tape, I always recommend using mold release. And I've learned the hardest lesson, I think only once where I completely forgot to use it. And you will be amazed at how well epoxy bonds to melamine because I literally had to run my entire table through a planer, planing off the melamine as it went because it would not come off. And I've talked to so many people that have had the same problem. So always use mold release. There is a right and a wrong way to apply the mold release. Whether you're doing the spray stuff or the brush on stuff, always spray, brush it on. I'll let it kind of dry for a couple minutes, kind of like a wax. Come back with a paper towel and buff it in really well. And the paper towel is probably the most important part because that's the way that you're ensuring that you're spreading it around the entire form. And then I always come back and I just do a second coat because the times I haven't done a second coat, I feel like I always get sections that will stick. If you do two coats and you work it in with a paper towel, I basically guarantee you'll be fine. This next rule is one that most people don't really talk about and I don't think most people are aware of. And that is that you really need to let these tables cure for two to three weeks before you move on to the next step of surfacing them, whether that's with like a router sled or running them through a planer. Most epoxies will say they cure in like 72 hours. And it's kind of true, but kind of not true. Meaning that it's the same with wood finishes. A lot of wood finishes will say they cure in 24 hours or they cure in seven days, but behind the scenes, they're actually continuing to cure for up to like six months. I I think it's lacquer that I just learned takes like six months to fully cure, which is crazy. If it's not lacquer, leave a comment and let me know which finish I'm thinking of. But I'm pretty sure one of those finishes says, you know, it cures in 24 hours or you can use it in three days, but it doesn't actually get its full strength and hardness for like six months. Epoxy isn't quite that bad, but it does take a couple of weeks before it is fully cured and hard and ready to work with. If you try surfacing it too soon, some problems that I've heard from people is that say you waited the 72 hours and you put it right in the planer and you sanded it and you finished it. People said that this epoxy continues to shrink as it cures just ever so slightly and it has caused their finish to be slightly wrinkly. Another issue is that it'll be pretty hard, but it'll still be slightly gummy, kind of like a hard rubber instead of that kind of hard plastic. So if you run it through a planer, you can get kind of really gummy chunks or if you try to sand it with your sander, you'll notice it's kind of rolling up these little rubbery pieces and that's because it's not cured, it's not hard yet. And so give it a couple more weeks and that will really ensure that your table is ready to work with. When I first started making these videos, people will ask me, why are you giving away all of your secrets when you are essentially helping out the competition? And at the time I didn't even really have a good answer for that. I thought, you know, maybe something good will come from it someday. And as it turns out, something really good did come from it. And that is that my business has transitioned from kind of a small part-time woodworking shop to really, I'm a, I'm a full-blown YouTuber. I can't even get the words out. It's still so hard for me to say, but yeah, I am a YouTuber. And that has enabled me to generate income from making these videos. You know, I can get sponsors and I do get some revenue from the views and I don't have to be as reliant on making furniture and worrying about my competition stealing clients from me. So I've been really lucky in that way. and. I don't think that it's right for everybody. If you are someone who wants to hold on to your secrets, I think that's totally fine. For me, I've just been rewarded a hundred times over what I've given out to the community by what I've gotten back. So if you have enjoyed this video, if you've enjoyed these tips, these tricks, these rules actually that I've given you, all I ask from you is that you hit that subscribe button right now. All right, this next tip is a little bit subjective based on how cool you can keep your epoxy. And that is to really limit how thick you pour your epoxy. And I limit mine personally to about two and a half inches. If you are a little bit newer to this or this is your first table, I would probably max it out at about 
two inches and I believe liquid glass says on their label two to four inches. And I think that's great. No, I take that back. I think that's horrible. I keep telling them, I wish they would remove that and put you know up to two inches on their label because I think it could save a lot of people a lot of problems because Yes, you can pour up to four inches, but you really, really have to know what you're doing. You need lots of air circulating underneath. You need air on top. You need a pretty cool room. And by that, I mean maybe a very cool room, you know, down to say 60 degrees or so. So I just avoid that whole mess and I limit my pours to about two to two and a half inches. And if I have a table that's say three inches, I'll do it in two pours. I'll try to do say two inches in the first pour and then I'll do my top off pour on a entirely second pour. If you don't know what can actually happen, if you pour too thick, you can have the same reaction that I had the very first time I made an epoxy table. And I've been making epoxy tables since before there was a deep pour epoxy. I used just regular boat epoxy and I didn't read the label or anything like that. And so poured my epoxy. First off, I used tape underneath, started leaking everywhere. My wife is laughing at me and I'm trying to frantically patch up this epoxy because it was like $40 worth of epoxy, which was a ton of money to me at the time. So I finally stopped the leak and it started smoking. And she's kind of looking at me like, is this supposed to smoke? And I'm like, I don't know. And then it continued to smoke. And then it was literally like hardening in front of us. It looked like one of those time-lapse videos of the desert drying out. And it started cracking right in front of us. So it turned to like glass, started cracking. And I was like, I don't know if this is gonna catch on fire or not. And she finally, starts reading the label and it says, you know, to limit your pores to an eighth of an inch or less. And she goes, did you even read the instructions? And of course I didn't read the instructions, but that same thing can happen on this deep pour epoxy. It just takes a lot more epoxy. So if you pour a full four inches on a warm day, even on a relatively cool day, that epoxy can overheat, crack, and there's basically no recovering from it. You need to break all that epoxy out and start all over again. So can be a really, really expensive failure. So if you want to avoid that potential catastrophe, just keep your pores to say inch and three quarter to two inches and you should be very safe. I still use fans. However, if you want to go up to maybe two and a half inches along with the use of fans, I think that's okay. This next rule is really a rule for anybody doing any woodworking, but I know we have a lot of new woodworkers out there that this epoxy woodworking has attracted. So you need to use dry wood and I, this is another lesson that I had to learn myself when I first started woodworking. I bought some wood off Craigslist. The guy's like, yeah, it's ready to go. And I'm like, okay, cool. I actually took it into creative woodworking, the place that's kind of like my longtime buddies now. First time I'd ever been there and I run it through their planer and you see this look that he's giving. And now I know the look and he starts touching it. And the reason he's touching it is this green wood will actually be really kind of cold to the touch because it's so wet. And he's kind of looking at it and he's touching it and he goes and he gets this funny little meter and he puts it on there and it's bouncing off the highest reading that this moisture meter has. And he's like, uh, this is pretty green. And I'm like, yeah, of course. What's that mean? It's not probably ready to work with. Oh, gotcha. What do you mean? you need wood to be dry before you use it. Okay, so what now? And he's like, I don't know, you know, maybe, you know, let it dry out for a couple months, which ended up being like a couple years for this wood to dry out. So I've been there, it's an easy mistake to make if you don't know, but you need wood to be dried and don't trust that local person on Craigslist to tell you that the wood is dry. You need to actually know if it's dry. And the only way to really know is to use a moisture meter. So hopefully the person selling you the wood has one or you just cross your fingers and hope that they are telling you the truth. And I have a whole video on buying wood, so I'll leave a link to that in the description below, but just make sure you have good dry wood. Also wood that has been treated for bugs. And so that can be treated via a kiln or via chemicals, but good dry wood that has been treated for bugs. The next rule is you need to use quality product, meaning you need to use a good premium epoxy. And that doesn't mean you have to use the epoxy that I use because I am sponsored by liquid glass and you might think that I am biased and totally am biased. So I will not leave a link in the description for you to go find a review. What you should do is Google it, do your own research, find out what other guys are using and find out which ones perform the best. And once you have your good epoxy, it is even more important to mix extraordinarily well. And this doesn't mean extraordinarily long. And it's much more important to mix well than to mix long. And what I mean by this is I've seen instructions on like Home Depot epoxy where it'll say mix for four minutes. And so some, what people will do is they'll stick a paddle mixer in there. They pull the trigger on their drill and they mix for four minutes. And what I've noticed on my projects is if you put it right in the middle and you 
turn that paddle mixer on, the edges stay almost completely clear if you put a bunch of pigment in the middle. So what that means is you're getting unmixed epoxy around the entire perimeter of your bucket. So I have a big fat stir stick like the kind they use in the five gallon buckets and I pull that trigger and I stir and I stir and I stir, scraping the side, scraping the bottom and I rotate the bucket just to make sure I'm not favoring one side. And I do this for probably a good two or three minutes. If you wanna be extra careful, the best method to avoid any problems is you do this for two or three minutes, you pour the entire thing into a second bucket, continue to mix, do the same thing in that second bucket, and now you basically guarantee you'll have a completely mixed, perfect ratio of epoxy. It's just too much work for me. So I don't do that, but what I do to avoid any issues is when I pour it into my mold, you don't wanna scrape the sides like you do like a cake batter bowl or like the cookie dough because any potentially unmixed epoxy is gonna be stuck to the sides or the bottom. So just let gravity pour all the epoxy out, leave the sides as they are, and that'll avoid getting any of that unmixed epoxy in your finished product. All right, as some of you may or may not know, every week I like to give a little bit of credit to the people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with your favorite one of these epoxy table making rules, and I will know that you made it all the way to the end of the video, and I promise I will answer all of your questions or comments first. As always, thank you so much for watching, and please subscribe for more videos just like this one. Oh, I have one bonus rule for you guys that stuck around for the real end of the video, and this one is just as important as the rest of them, so I hope everybody catches this one. But the rule is this. You need to seal the top of your wood slabs with something. That can be shellac, that can be epoxy, that can be polyurethane. And the reason is this, is I mentioned before, we're gonna leave these slabs in the form for two or three weeks, maybe even a month. And when we pour our river portion, that epoxy is gonna seep underneath our slabs and it's gonna seal it watertight. It's gonna, there's not gonna absorb any moisture, any air is gonna to touch the bottom of those slabs. The top, however, is exposed to the air. So if it's not sealed with something, it's gonna to continue to absorb moisture from the air and cause it to warp and crack and twist and can actually completely ruin a project. I've seen some really gnarly results from people that left them in the mold for a few weeks and didn't seal the top with something. So make sure you seal the top with that shellac, epoxy, or polyurethane. Okay, now I promise the video is actually over.